Good morning, everyone. My name is Jana Batalova, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute. And I would like to welcome uh, all of you to the webinar called uh, With Millions of Unfilled US Jobs, What Role is There for Immigration? Uh, first, a quick uh, housekeeping note. If you have any technical difficulties, please email us at events at migrationpolicy.org or call us at 202-266-1929. We will have a Q&A session in the end of the call. Uh, there will be no voice Q&A session, so please type any questions that you have um, in, in the Q&A box or email us at events at migrationpolicy.org. Don't forget to, to tweet um, about the event and your thoughts and, and everything you learned about uh, the, the, uh, from our um, guest speaker, speakers and uh, share this event on your social media. So let's begin. Uh, faced with the workforce and society that are aging, the uh, shocks, uh, economic shocks uh, after the uh, of the pandemic, growing inequality and the changing skills needs uh, driven by automation and globalization. The big policy question is uh, how to achieve a post-economic recovery, and there is a great emphasis on rethinking on uh, rethinking on how to create a work environment where all available skills and talents are put to, to, to their best use. One component of this puzzle is harnessing immigration talent for a future economic growth. Um, for everyone who's been um, who followed immigration for, for a while, you know that immigration has been a long time uh, proven policy tool uh, available to address labor uh, and sk uh, shortages and skill skills gaps, and we see there are three uh, we see three primary strategies to tap immigrant talent. Uh, the first two fall into the immigrant integration policy domain. Uh, one is recognizing talent by better better accounting for immigrant origin adults prior experience in education, and thereby reducing underemployment or what we call brain waste. Uh, an example of which would be uh, uh, a doctor driving Uber, so a college-educated person uh, working in most of the job or not working at all. Uh, the second strategy is developing talent or growing your own talent. And that is by principally expanding immigrant origin adults as well as other adults uh, access to post-secondary education and professional credentials. And the third uh, strategy is attracting talent or bringing new workers from abroad. And that is by developing immigration selection systems that meet the current and future labor needs across all skills levels. To discuss these strategies and empower us with research and practice-based knowledge, uh, we have a terrific lineup of speakers, each bring a wealth of knowledge um, to this discussion. They're passionate about their work and they're recognized thought leaders. So this morning we have with us uh, Harry Halter, who's a professor of public policy at Georgetown University and the former chief economist uh, for the U.S. Department of Labor under the Obama administration. Dr. Holzer focuses on his research and work on education and workforce issues and labor market policy. Uh, Gina krauss Wilmar is the president and CEO of uh, a terrific organization called uh, Upper Lee Global. Under Gina leadership, Upper Lee Global continues its uh, work in uh, in eliminating educational and employment barriers for immigrant and, re and refugee professionals and advance the inclusion of their skills into the U.S. economy. 
It's done in big part through collaborations with private and public partners. Alex Manuel is a consultant uh, for the World Education Services and a former executive director of Washington State's Professional Educator Standards Board. Alex is a, a strategic leader who focuses on expanding access to educator preparation um, and addressing education, educator shortages and uh, educator diversity in the workforce. And last but not, not least is my um, colleague, Muzaffar Chishchi, uh, who is a senior uh, fellow at MBI and director of the MBI's office in, uh, at New York uh, University School of Law. Uh, his work focuses on US immigration policy at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, the intersection of, of the labor and immigration policy uh, immigrant enforcement, civil liberties, and, and immigrant integration. So you could see from this very brief introduction, and you could read more in depth in, that, in, the, in their bios on their websites, uh, that we have a terrific lineup of speakers. Um, so thank you very much for all speakers including joining the call today. And this webinar also features uh, some of the key findings from a new report that my colleague Michael Fix and I wrote with the uh, support of the Walter Foundation. And the, uh, uh, the report uh, was released today. It's available on MPI's website and it is called Leveraging the Skills of uh, Immigrant Healthcare Professionals in Illinois and Chicago. I will. Uh, turn to uh, Harry Holzer, uh, who will give us an overview of demographic and labor market uh, trends, the big picture, so to speak. So we have context uh, for the discussion later on. And uh, we specifically asked him to touch on the scope and uh, reality of skill shortages. Uh, Harry? Uh, thank you, Jana. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, important discussion today. Um, I think I'll take a few minutes, uh, first of all, to address the issue of labor shortages, what's actually happening in the US labor market now, the relation to those shortages to skills, uh, and, and then bring in the immigrant population uh, in that context. So let's start with the first basic question. Is there now a labor shortage in the US? The answer is very clearly yes. Uh, how do we know that? We know that because two of the best measures of, of, of a shortage, the job vacancy rate and what's happening to wage growth, both indicate, those are both high numbers right now and they indicate a shortage is going on. Uh, let me be clear, there are always vacancies and there's always unemployed people in the US economy. You know, it, it's an economy where, where there's churning, people quit jobs, they look for new jobs. Uh, it's very unusual to have a vacancy rate almost twice the unemployment rate and that's what we have right now. Uh, as you can see from those numbers, and wage growth, nominal wage growth in the U.S., I mean, not adjusting for inflation, is over 5% right now. That's quite high by historical standards. Uh, of course, inflation right now is running even higher, um, but, but it looks like the wage growth is high. It's likely contributing to that inflation. And if you ask why, why is... Uh, why is there this labor shortage going on? I, I, I think there's three reasons. Uh, number one, the labor force participation rate has dropped during COVID uh, and some workers, at least often moms, some elderly workers haven't come back. Number two, a lot of people are quitting because they have dissatisfaction with various characteristics of their jobs, both low wages and, and other things. And number three, people are turning down potential offers, again, because they're being, at least for now, they're being choosier, they want more. And all those things together uh, generate um, uh, a labor shortage uh, in our market. Next. But then the question is, okay, is, is the shortage worse for skilled labor than for unskilled labor or, or an unmet need for skills driving some of this? And before, before we dive into that question, it really depends on a couple of things. Number one, it depends on whether or not you're looking at the short run, in other words, the next year or two, or a longer run perspective. The data I've quoted right now are very much short run. That's the economy right now. We want to think about the long run as well. It also depends on how do we define skills. Are we defining skills based on some level of post-secondary educational attainment, 
having an AA degree, having a BA, or some specific occupational skill, like being a machinist or, or, uh, uh, or a health tech or something like that. So let's keep both of those issues in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So let me focus first on the short run, uh, what's happening now uh, and, and over the next year or two. Um, our skills driving or unmet need for skills driving the shortages right now, the quick answer is I wouldn't say it's driving them because actually the highest vacancy rate and the highest wage growth is actually occurring in the lowest skill and lowest wage sectors of the economy, leisure, hospitality, uh, and retail. And here I've listed the vacancy rates uh, and the wage growth rates are, are very high um, in those sectors. And, and that's not a skill issue. That's a dissatisfaction of workers with the quality of work and the quality of jobs. But if you look at some other sectors where skills matter more, professional services, healthcare, you also see pretty high vacancy rates there, pretty high wage growth going on there. And anecdotally, uh, descriptively, you hear a lot about the difficulty employers have finding workers with very specific occupation and industry skills. I've listed a few of them, long haul trucking, machinists in manufacturing, welders in manufacturing, nursing. So what I would say there is a skill shortage is not driving overall the current shortage labor market, but probably in specific sectors, it likely contributes to that shortage. And I mean that skills can play some role perhaps in addressing that. Uh, next slide, please. And when we turn to the long run, you know, beyond just the next few years, I would say something fairly similar. Now, economists tend to not believe that shortages last forever, that shortages go on and on and on in the long run, because right? markets, markets have ways of adjusting to those shortages. You know, wages can go up, that draws in workers, employers can train more people, uh, et cetera. And we think those adjustment mechanisms will keep us from having permanent shortages on the other hand, you can have spot shortages in these labor markets, spot shortages in particular regions, particular occupations and industries, and those can, can go on for a while. And in an economy with strong labor demand and tight labor markets, you're likely gonna get more of those spot shortages and employers might be more challenged to try to find these skilled workers. So, so again, not long-term shortages, but, but tight labor markets and spot shortages in specific places. So what, what does this mean for, for different segments of the workforce? The college-aided workforce, I would say, is not in shortage right now, but, but labor demand is strong. Uh, and the trends in earnings, the trends in labor force participation, LFP, are considerably better for college grads than they are for, say, people with only high school or high school or less. So demand there is strong, if not even in shortage. Now, when you look at the market for people Above the BA level, people with graduate degrees of various kinds, there the earnings growth is very strong. The demand is very strong, and, and there the, the, the likelihood of shortages uh, is, is, is greater. Um, and then if you look at some specific occupations, I would say especially the STEM occupations, uh, you have lasting challenges for employers in terms of bringing in skilled workers. And, 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 and this is certainly true for BA and above, but even below BA, uh, some, of the, some of the skilled technical jobs in healthcare and other sectors uh, that require at least an associate's degree. Uh, you know, you see shortages there as well. And there's a National Academy of Science study, I think it came out in 2017, on the skilled technical workforce. It has a lot of data indicating spot shortages, difficulties filling those jobs. Um, I, I was a member of that, of that research panel, uh, and, and that has a lot of the data. So again, in specific skilled areas by specific measures of skills, tight demand, strong demand, tight markets, and, and sometimes spot shortages. Two more things having to do with the baby boomers retiring. Number one, a lot of the workers that have the necessary skills in, in a range of industries, certainly construction and manufacturing, certainly healthcare, transportation, uh, distribution, logistics, et cetera, uh, a, a lot of those workers are either Gen X workers or baby boomers. So as those baby boomers retire, there will be strong replacement demand for workers with those skills in those particular occupations and industries. And, and as the baby boomer retirements accelerate, you'll see more of that replacement demand. 
And the other thing is that the, the aging of the baby boomers themselves will create a lot of demand for health care and elder care, right? The need for care to take, to take care of these individuals. You know, those are not all highly skilled jobs, but, but certainly some of them are. Uh, and, and baby boomer aging will create demand there as well. So, so again, you see strong demand for skills in the long run as well as the short run measured a variety of ways. Next slide, please. So now let me turn to immigration. What do we say about immigration in this context? Let me start with another simple question. Does the US need more immigrants? I think the answer is clearly yes. Uh, uh, and, 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 and having shown that we do have a strong labor shortage right now, a labor shortage that is contributing to inflation, uh, that, that's an indication uh, that, that we need more immigrants. But more broadly, what's going on? Um, the native born population, uh, uh, is either declining or, or growing very, very slowly. And that's a combination of sort of the aging uh, of the native born population and low birth rates that have been low now for two, three decades. So again, those two, you know, people aging out, fewer births in the native born population coming in leads to sort of stagnant population growth. If you don't have population growth, you can't have labor force growth. If you don't have labor force growth, it's very hard to have economic growth, very simply. And we want economic growth. Economies that don't have population and labor force growth tend to be more stagnant. Demand for investment and technology is weaker. Uh, and, and, and so innovation stagnates in those economies. We want economic growth and immigration there would help a lot. There's other arguments. There are fiscal effects. You know, We need more working bodies to pay the taxes for all those retirement programs for baby boomers. Uh, we want help with more workers would help reduce price inflation. And the other thing is that supply of immigration has fallen off. And if you look at overall immigration trends over the last 10 years, there was clearly a Donald Trump effect discouraging the overall flow of, infant, you know, of immigrants. And there clearly was a COVID effect on top of that. So immigration flows have fallen. So again, but then what's the role, what's the role of skills uh, in, in this uh, kind of a, a, a world. Um, so economists think about immigration in the following way. You know, economists love to think of everything in terms of benefits and costs. All immigrants provide some benefits. They tend to reduce costs and raise output in the sectors they work in. All immigrants have some costs, uh, not the least of which is competition with native born workers. So it's always a question of comparing the benefits and costs in those sectors. And most economists believe the benefit cost ratio is higher for skilled than for unskilled immigrants. Uh, again, regardless of whether you measure skill as BA and above or specific occupational skills. What does the evidence show on that? So for skilled workers, skilled workers not only fill jobs that are out there, they help create jobs as well as filling them. And they contribute to innovation. Uh, and innovation is very important going forward. If we want a dynamic economy that creates good jobs, a, a competitive economy, um, innovation is very important. And Jana earlier used the word talent. You need the best talent to contribute to innovation. And in many cases, uh, highly skilled immigrants provide that talent. The evidence is very clear. They generate many patents, the US economy, they generate many business startups. They meet the STEM needs of employers uh, that are harder to fill without them. Now, are there unemployed native born engineers uh, and PhDs? Yes, there are sometimes. And bigger immigrant flows might contribute to even more of that. But if we want our industries, our innovative industries to have the very best talent uh, to make sure that we are one of the top competitors when it comes to uh, when it comes to 5G or artificial intelligence, we need the best, the very best talent out there. And what people in this industry say, there's a big difference between the best and the second best in this industry and, and, and skilled immigration helps meet that. Need. Now, when you're talking about less skilled immigration, you, you do get benefits, but, but there I think there is more competition with native born workers. And there there's probably more contribution to inequality between less skilled and more educated workers in America. And that inequality has grown, grown, grown very dramatically. Um, do I think that less skilled immigration is a major contributor to inequality? No, I can, I'd probably rank it out of all the factors, sixth or seventh on my list. It contributes a bit to rising inequality. And yet there are other positive effects of 
less skilled workers as well. There's a very new paper uh, by two economists, Kristen Butcher and Tara Watson, indicating that in those parts of the United States that have a large flow of unskilled workers, you, have, you see less institutionalization of the elderly. There's fewer elderly going to nursing homes, which is extremely costly to our economy and, 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 and to programs like, like Medicare and Medicaid. So even here, less skilled immigrants can play a positive role, just not quite as much as the most skilled immigrants. And indeed, the composition of immigrants has already been shifting since about 2000. You've had fewer Mexican workers, although we do see big flows of people from Central America trying again, you've had more Asians. And the question is, should we reinforce those shifts already occurring with policy? And I would say yes. So my final slide, what does all of this mean for policy? And, and again, in a world where the politics of immigration, as we know, are very, very fraught right now, in, in, a, in a world where a lot of politicians become populists, I would say the following. We need to raise overall immigration levels as much as the political system will allow us. But within that pool of immigrants, I would have some greater tilt uh, towards high demand sectors, workers with, with higher education, workers with specific occupational skills that we need. Um, I'll mention a caveat. We know the Federal Reserve is starting to raise interest rates to fight inflation. We don't know if that will generate what economists call a soft or a hard landing for the economy. We might well have a recession. If we get a hard landing, that recession will certainly dampen or eliminate these shortages in the short term, or even in the medium term, say the next one to five years. But that doesn't change the long-term picture and the long-term picture of the positive contributions that skilled immigrants can make to our economy. There's other issues about automation we can talk about, but, but I think I'll stop here and turn it back to Jana. Thank you. Um, thank you, Harry, for this excellent um, overview of key trends that, that will change, that, that are changing the, uh, the needs for, for different kinds of uh, workers and where immigration can um, can be helpful in addressing these needs. Um, as you were talking about this, it, it, um, the, the national these national level uh, trends are replicated uh, throughout throughout the country. Um, in the report that Michael and I were using today, we focused on Illinois and Chicago, and one of the very first apparent uh, trends for us was that the population um, it, uh, and, uh, aging and diversity will shape the future demand um, and supply of all sorts of workers. You, Harry, you mentioned healthcare workers as one of the um, uh, sectors that will be uh, expanding across all skills levels of the higher and the low skill uh, still be off. And that's what we see in, uh, that was we saw, saw in Illinois. Uh, the, the total state population is aging. Uh, the, uh, the workforce in the health, the healthcare workforce is, is aging. Uh, it is especially the case in, in, in rural areas. Um, and on top of that, Illinois population is becoming more racially and ethnically uh, diverse. Um, and so all these trends will, 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 will play out um, and mean a great deal in terms of uh, the number of workers uh, available to provide healthcare as well as other services, as well as um, the, ki the kind and the type of care they will be able uh, uh, to provide. We found that immigrants are already an essential component of the healthcare um, in, in Illinois and, and uh, Chicago, um, and uh, the, the state has uh, already experienced shortages and uh, even before the pandemic, the pandemic just aggravated. Again, trends are uh, similar in, in other uh, states in the Midwest and other parts of the country. Um, but uh, what we also found in our work is, is that uh, there is a significant number of immigrant healthcare providers, or, uh, I'm sorry, immigrants with healthcare and medical degrees uh, who are underemployed uh, for all sorts of reasons, but often because their uh, education and professional credentials uh, obtained abroad were not recognized. 
At the national level, we found that close to 270,000 healthcare, immigrant healthcare providers are un underemployed. Uh, in other words, they work in most of the jobs or they are out of work altogether. So I'm going to turn uh, to Gina, um, um, who will discuss how we can address uh, highly skilled immig immig immigrants underemployment and how we can recognize the immigrant talent that we already have and currently are not using very well. Great. I love being in this conversation. Um, so I think this is a great segue because, you know, Harry and Jana, you just clearly articulated that we do need immigrants, not only for our labor markets, but also for, our, for resilient communities. Um, but the reality is, is, you know, at Upwardly Global, we've served 20,000 of these individuals to help them re-enter their careers, and we know that they're not plug and play. So there is a real challenge around, along that inclusion journey. Um, so I'm going to, you know, give you a couple of examples of some of those challenges that we've seen and some of the solutions we're starting to see um, pop up in the market. Um, so just to reorient everybody, so immigrants face many challenges when they're trying to enter into the workforce, in, including prof immigrant professionals, um, but they sit at the intersection of a lot of things as well. Um, for example, uh, another MPI report which highlighted that highly skilled immigrant adults, the odds of unemployment for Blacks immigrants are is 54% higher compared to their white counterparts, right? And for Latinos, that's 40% higher. Um, immigrant women with foreign degrees are more likely to be underemployed than any other group. So we know that immigrants are also sitting at intersections of barriers around color and gender, etc. So that's just something we need to keep in mind because when we're talking about inclusion, we're also talking about a group of people that are facing similar barriers to many Americans who also sit at some of those intersections. Um, so let me give you an example of, of the employer side. Under COVID, we had huge shortages in the healthcare system. We've had shortages in the healthcare system for a very long time and COVID exacerbated that. Um, we worked with New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, to help them fill in some of those shortages across um, their industry needs. They needed healthcare professionals, they needed IT professionals, they needed business uh, administration and logistics. The hospital system needs a great diverse talent of individuals that is very hard for them to reach and very hard for them to get and, and employ quickly. Um, we had a wonderful speaker on one of our webinars who said, uh, this is a national security issue at this stage. Our inability to have a labor force that's able to help us address the challenges that lay in front of us is a real national security risk for the country. So that means we had a sense of urgency. And I wanna say there's an important this sense of urgency to start seeing things move. Um, and this is one of those cases where we've had a long standing challenge in healthcare and healthcare shortages um, for, for talent but it was the urgency around the situation that allowed for that innovation to think about how do we cross that hurdle and how do we tap an, into non-traditional talent, which includes this population. So for New York Presbyterian, they started an on-ramps program. Um, they have a three month, what I call mid because these people are not doing entry-level work, they're doing mid-skill work, um, a mid program to help understand the talent of these individuals, how they plug and play into their workforce and into their workplace culture and better assess their skills through that mechanism to then help place them into long-term jobs. And so we right now are working with 50 um, job seekers in this program um, and we're adding more cohorts um, every month. And out of those, 25% uh, have already have placements and the commitment is, is they will get, they will all get a placement. Um, it's just really about having the HR unpack the skills of these individuals. So why does an HR company need to unpack skills if it's so obvious from their resumes? Well, it's not obvious from their resumes, right? It, it is very difficult to understand and translate international work experience and international credentials. Um, and HR companies or HR, uh, in, you know, HR teams really struggle with that. Um, so they, they, you know, they look at uh, 60 resumes in an hour, right? And so this is a turn, this is a real turn. So there needs to be some education, but also some mechanisms to allow these companies to really help process. 
So in this case, you have an employer already solving around the talent shortage gaps by tapping into this untapped talent pool by creating sort of a mechanism that allows them to assess their skills and then help place them accurately into a position. And I will tell you, we have uh, you know, job seekers who are homeless, who are asylum seekers, who are living in shelters, who are now employed through this program. So I think the other thing to, to mention is, is these are real people, but the how far they can fall is also very real. And that just tells you how, um, how undervalue, how much we undervalue their, their contributions and how we really need to reverse that. The second example I want to give you is the executive order that Upwardly Global helped pass with a lot of other great organizations, including WES and MPI on this call um, for uh, allowing internationally trained doctors to get authorization to serve un under the supervision of a licensed doctor in Illinois. Um, now we had several states uh, about six other states who issued executive orders. Um, and in the state of Illinois, they've already uh, approved, they, are, they have 1,000 applications and they've already approved 360. That's a, the largest number from any of those six states. We've had states like Nevada who only approved four, right? So there's a huge difference between um, what Illinois is trying to push. And there's a reason for this. If you build it, and they will come is not a thing. If you build something first, it really needs to be built to address the barriers that real people face. It needs to be user-friendly so they can actually navigate through the system. And it, there needs to be an opportunity to work in coalition to build a field of partners who can actually make sure this is a success. So we had a incredible coalition of partners, not only on the research side to help educate policymakers, we had employers helping to articulate what their pain points were, but we also had an incredible number of community-based organizations, whether they were, um, you know, uh, doctor associations for the, Af the pa Pakistani community, or whether they were the nurse International Nursing Association, we had an incredible number of CBOs who were coming together to build the field. And it's interesting because when you, you don't do advocacy and we are actually not an advocacy organization, um, we're a workforce inclusion organization, but when you start to do advocacy, you start to realize that field building is a thing. Because if you don't have partners that can ensure the success of a policy or ensure that we're learning from the policy and improving it through practice, that policy will be a failure. And we can't afford for those to be failures because they are so hard for us to push and push forward. So we have to be incredibly strategic and we have to work together. Um, and I think that was, so this couple of learnings we got from that experience was is that we need to be bringing employers together and policymakers and community-based organizations and we need to take time for that. The second thing is there's a real education curve that needs to happen. And um, this report from MPI for the state of Illinois couldn't be more perfectly timed um, because now with this emergency order, we've learned a couple of things. We've learned that short-term hiring is a real challenge for companies. So people, the 360 people who are now authorized to work underneath a doctor need to find jobs. And employers struggle to hire somebody if they can only hire them for four to six months, right? So that's a learning. We have to extend that time frame to make it effective for employers and to make it reasonable for job seekers to quit a job, to take a job that you might only have for three to six months is a really hard thing to do. I wouldn't do it. Um, and so that's one piece of learning. The other piece of learning is, is there's a lot of challenges around understanding insurance, understanding process, and really thinking about how can we start creating one-stop shops for skilled professionals who are working in regulated industries. So we've got high skilled professionals that are in un less regulated industries like technology that tech that hire based on skill where it's actually in some ways easier for folks to get jobs because they don't have to to unpack and jump through so many hurdles. They might need to get reskilled or upskilled to be competitive in the labor market, but they don't also have to also navigate their credential and the licensing markets, right? Whereas in regulated industries, they have to navigate both of those. And it's different state by state in some of these cases. So that makes it a bit of a challenge. And having a one-stop shop for these individuals so that they're touching the, the, the Department of Education and the Department of Licensing and the Department of Labor and all of these pieces in one go will really help facilitate that. 
that's one of the pieces of learning we've come out with it. But the exciting thing is, is now we're translating all of this wonderful learning into um, a bill that was passed by representative, introduced by Representative Ma, um, passed by both the House and the Senate unanimously, and is now looking to be signed by Governor Pritzker um, that helps create a task force to look at how do we have permanent legislative change that reduces barriers for entry for trained doctors. Um, and so that gives us an opportunity to take that learning and then translate it and get even better so that when it does come out, we're, we're a real success. So I'm going to, um, I could talk forever, but I'm going to stop there because I know there's so many other wonderful panelists who want to also speak. Oh, thank you, Gina. And um, as, as you mentioned in our report, um, we were working on, on our, uh, we were doing research and interviewing various stakeholders in Illinois, in Illinois right before uh, we started working collectively uh, through partnerships with representatives of law. And what, what what was so striking about that um, our uh, learnings from, from that experience is that the importance of having um, well-versed uh, stakeholders uh, on the ground. Because you, you can't really mount an effort like this that would in half a year essentially will get an emergency order and a, a bill that would create a task force without um, uh, a coordination of uh, stakeholders that that are um, they're knowledgeable, uh, they have experience, and they are connected. And building these connections uh, takes takes time and, and experience. And I, I my my guess is that other states, uh, in particular in the Midwest, um, are in a similar position, maybe a little bit behind, in maybe, maybe a little bit ahead of Illinois, but there is a lot of opportunity, there is a lot of energy, creative uh, energy and, and um, ongoing discussions. And that really makes me uh, hopeful uh, that research like ours can be used to advance uh, this issue forward at the policy level, at the employer level, uh, at the level of um, um, education. So that's very, very exciting. Um, I would like to switch gears to uh, something else. You might have heard that the National Guard uh, members were deployed in hospitals at the beginning uh, of the pandemic uh, to, to help overwhelm doctors and nurses. Earlier this year, National Guard was deployed, um, in New Mexico uh, asked National Guard uh, to work at substitute, as substitute teachers in in uh, in order to keep uh, their classrooms open. So, does it mean that uh, a national guard deployment is a is an indicator of shortages? Well, there must be a better way of fill those shortages that turn to national guard every time. Um, so, I'm going to turn to Alex and ask her to discuss. Um, how immigrants who are already in the United States um, can help address the teacher shortages, uh, including the existing opportunities to integrate immigrant origin uh, in internationally trained teachers. Thank you. Um, and it's great to be here with all of you. Um, so uh, I, I really appreciate the comments um, uh, from my fellow panelists um, earlier. Um, and Gina, as, as we think about the education sector, one of the things that I think is absolutely relevant from some of the things that you said is looking at the urgency, um, thinking about the assessment of skills and kind of, um, and then thinking about how we manage talent and really think about policy. What we're seeing um, in the education sector, um, you know, as as you talked about, um, Gina, um, as you know, every single day you see an article in the newspaper talking about teacher shortage, um, whether that's the governor or the National Guard or superintendents that are um, actively um, engaged in being the educators um, uh, in you know local communities, and and this is very much a um, a function of shortage. Um, we also see that, you know, 
when we think about diversity and the educator workforce, um, there is a lot of opportunity where over 50% of our nation's children in public schools are students of color, um, where we're seeing in many states uh, between five to 20% if it's uh, of uh, educators um, being educators of color. So really not representing the communities that, that they serve. Um, we, one of the things I think um, actually when you were talking about research as well, um, we know that when we look at um, comparatively to healthcare versus um, let's say um, the educator workforce, um, in healthcare, we've seen a, a lot of integration of highly skilled immigrants that are internationally trained. Um, and a study um, based on uh, data that came from uh, MPI's American Community Survey, um, there were 263,000 foreign born adults that already had four year degrees that were teaching uh, in teaching. Um, most of them were, um, this data came from um, 2010, 2012, I would imagine it's even more significant um, now, uh, you know, 7% were unemployed, 35% were employed in low skilled jobs, 24% um, in middle, school, middle skilled jobs are still under, um, under uh, employed, and um, just 36% in high skilled jobs utilizing their degree um, as a teacher. Um, this compares to, you know, close to 72% um, within the healthcare sector. So quite a big difference. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think is uh, important to think about as we think about the educator workforce. Um, as we think about what we want to see, uh, you know, in, in the workforce, uh, there are multiple roles that need, need um, need to be filled. Um, like I said, every day, um, an article, um, shortages of substitutes, paraeducators, teachers, um, and, and shortage looking at the geographic location, so rural and remote um, educators, um, also looking at uh, dual language programs, so um, having the opportunity to have language skills, um, which is a great place to plug in for our highly skilled immigrants. And also um, really thinking about CTE, how we train um, those with, um, you know, focused um, professional skills uh, that can include, um, you know, welding, uh, uh, art, cooking, all of these types of things that have more uh, technical skills as well, um, that have very um, significant shortages in, in around, around the country. Um, we're seeing that, uh, you know, where there's opportunity is to really um, think about how do we grow a culturally competent and linguistically diverse workforce um, that really reflects the diversity of the students that we uh, want to see. An example that I think of something that uh, I think a lot of people don't know is that when you look at the communities around the country, when you think about your rural and remote communities and even some of your suburban communities, your the school districts themselves are the largest employers in many cases. And often they don't see themselves in that capacity and the talent management pieces that are, are needed, um, this is where we have the opportunity to, to grow and build partnerships and, and think about this work. And I'll talk a little bit about the work um, with Teacher Bridge that we're doing at um, WES, uh, where we're working with local communities around the country to really build those partnerships, um, make uh, changes and, and, and uh, focus on policy shifts that prioritize um, internationally trained um, immigrants in education. Um, and, and often this is really your parents and families that are already attending school. So they are a user of schools, but they're not part of the workforce. And this is, I think, where we have an opportunity to really think about what can this look like? So engage parents and families that are in the educator workforce, particularly um, immigrants and refugees that are um, already have um, degrees or could go into alternative route or alternative um, education programs to become teachers um, that have subject matter knowledge or school-based knowledge. Um, this is a tremendous uh, strategy, we think, to really address educator shortage. Um, it is also a strategy to diversify the educator workforce to better reflect the uh, and serve the student population and to navigate some of the pathways into the profession. 
Um, so in thinking about that, we we really um, have uh, uh, at West have uh, uh, been thinking about how do we really transform and engage communities um, to prioritize grow your own programs, programs that grow and recognize talent in the local community and um, and build off of de degrees already had and provide guidance and support um, as, as previously talked about. Um, some of these types of initiatives include transition to teaching courses. They include alternative programs that are job embedded, learning how to teach while teaching, uh, that are focused on apprenticeship, residency, um, also ways to really build um, capacity within the workforce. Um, uh, it allows districts to really meet direct needs. You know, I've seen uh, my local district has uh, upwards of, you know, 65 openings um, for next year in a, a, in a smaller district. Um, many districts are trying to prioritize or roll out dual language programs as well. And this is an opportunity for our, um, our skilled immigrants to, to plug in or to um, pursue additional education so that they can. Um, and uh, many times I think the order of education um, and um, teachers is changing. Um, many times we're seeing districts hire folks and really plan out their development process. This is something historically we haven't seen as much, but because of the tremendous shortages that we see um, this is, I think, a trend that we will continue to see more of. Um, with our Teacher Bridge initiative, I'll, I'll just end with this, is that we've really worked with six partners around the country um, to really navigate pathways to teaching for internationally trained educators and professionals, develop um, strategies and guides, really focus on not only um, you know, pathways, but policy partnerships, um, what, what will it take to really build a coalition of folks to really navigate and make changes to make this more accessible for community members? Um, what kinds of uh, technical assistance and support is needed for community organizations to do this work? And also to think about how do we make more visible, grow your own programs that help um, uh, immigrant communities uh, become uh, educators in the workforce. And we are hopeful that we will see um, some of the growth that we have seen in other sectors like healthcare um, to make sure that um, we really have well-represented, culturally responsive, linguistically diverse um, uh, educator workforce as we go into the future. Turn it back to you. Um, thank you, Alex. So we talked about two strategies so far, recognizing talent and developing talent. I'm going to ask Moose uh, to talk about attra attracting talent. Uh, thank you so much, Jana, and thank you to all the uh, participants who have joined us this morning on behalf of MPI. Uh, I was really listening to this. I was really wondering what skills do I have to contribute to this uh, to this panel. Uh, I'm going to enter this from the policy point of view, which increasingly looks like a dubious skill uh, because we have had no success in policy making, which sort of tells you something either the caliber of us who are in it or the challenges of making policy in our country. Uh, all of you have spoken with much better knowledge and credentials about the need to attract um, talent or foreign workers in this to, the, to our country. And I think there is universal recognition of this and has been for a number of years. But we know that our immigration selection system has not responded to this. I mean, I never get tired of saying that our immigration selection system is based on a 1952 architecture. I mean, this is almost as old as the Cold War. And we have tinkered with it only lightly in four or five times since then, slightly in 65, slightly in 86, and slightly in 1990. We haven't even adjusted the levels of immigration to our country since 1990. I mean, a whole generation of labor economists have come and retired in the meantime. Just the number of chairs of our subcommittees and full committees who have gone into retirement in this meantime must be legendary. We have recessions and small recessions of many kinds that have happened in these years since then. We have had four seismic events like 9-11, 
the Great Recession of 2008, election of Donald Trump, and the Great Pandemic, which have had a huge impact on the labor market. And we haven't changed our immigration system. It doesn't, from a high altitude, that doesn't make sense to any smart person in this country. But that's the paralysis of our immigration selection system. And let me quickly say, to my mind, in the context of the skills conversation we have happened, where does this lie? Uh, I mean, despite all these lack of changes in our immigration system, for the last 20 years, we have been admitting 1 million people a year as green card holders. From 2001 to 2019, about 1 million people. I mean, pretty close to 1 million. The only times we had a dip in this are few in 2003 and four, and once in 2013, when it went slightly lower. We have the, the levels have gone down since 2016, but only because 2016 was a very high level of immigration. And the last, even during the Trump era, they remained high, except in the last year, 2020, when they have gone slightly down to about 700,000 people. But of all these million people, let's average it to million, about two thirds of people are selected on the basis of family. I have nothing against families, but they're not based, selected on the basis of their skill or their, or their uh, measured contribution to the skills and the labor market of our country. Only about 15% of our employment-based immigration is based on labor demand. And that includes the family members of the principal workers. So therefore, essentially only about 7% of our total immigration to the country for permanent immigration is based on the understood established labor market need of the country. Now that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you tell people that, either from a Trump a supporter or to the most liberal person on immigration. So something is odd just about that picture which may also appreciate why we have such high level of unauthorized immigration. Because when the opportunities of coming through legal immigration are so narrow and small, the laws of supply and demand are actually working magically, except people are using the unlawful channels to enter instead of the authorized channels. That's your connection to the legal immigration debate. Now, of these people who enter in the employment-based stream, this is a highly twisted uh, sort of a stream. About 80% of these people actually adjust in the United States. They are people who move from one non-immigrant status to another non-immigrant status. And in this case, let me also say that in, since I said that family immigration is so important component of immigration, the future of our immigration is going to be determined by who are the new seed immigrants in, in immigration selection system, who are entering it for the first time. This is what, what the demographers call the new seed immigrants. All the new seed immigrants are coming predominantly through our adjustment of status from people going from non-immigrant to, to, to immigrant status. And these are mostly and H-1B workers and a slight sprinkling of L workers. Uh, I think the data shows that if you combine the H-1B workers and the L-1 workers, that's about 80% of people who get adjusted coming from these two streams. Now, of these streets, since such as predominant flow is coming from the H-1Bs, just look at who is coming through the H-1B program. In the H-1B program, it's heavily dominated by computer-based skills. But my last calculation was pretty close to 49.1% of people who got H-1Bs in the last few years have come from computer-based skills. So it's a highly narrow, highly, highly specialized group of people entering, which therefore means people in the rest of the skills don't have really robust lawful opportunities of entering the immigration selection system. And we think that's not a good idea. This is just not meeting the spectrum of needs and occupations for the best interest of the United States. So we at MPI are suggesting a rehaul of our selection system. Uh, my colleague, uh, Julia Gillard, who I hope is listening, is our principal thinker on this. And we have, we have announced it about two years ago that we think that we should really replace the current selection of employment-based system with something called a bridge visa. That except for the small groups of people who come in extraordinary abilities like 
Einsteins of the world, for lack of any other term, on one hand, and people coming to do seasonal work on the other hand, people coming to do one crop or one work at a, at a resort in the summer or winter. Everyone else from one spectrum of the occupations to the other should be placed in a new category called the bridge visa. To us, the bridge visa would sort of bridge the spectrum of occupations, cover both high skills, low skills, and mid skills, and would also bridge between temporary and permanent immigration. Because we have this strange kind of charge dichotomy between temporary and, and permanent immigration today. People stay in H-1Bs for years just because of the lack of numbers, which doesn't help their, them and doesn't help the labor market. We think putting everyone in the bridge visa would sort of, sort of break that dichotomy also. So under this scheme, to put it very quickly, employers would still sponsor workers. They would have to test the labor market. And we think testing the labor market should improve. Right now, we have a joke of a test in the labor market. If you have a good immigration lawyer and you can find the right newspaper to place your ad in, you will meet the requirements of the Department of Labor. We don't think that's the adequate test of the labor market. So we should improve and streamline the testing of the labor market to make sure that no US worker is being displaced or undermined by a foreign worker. That means better relationship between state departments of labor, between federal departments, of labor for this for the certification system. We also believe we may have a blanket labor certification system. That there are some employers who have established that they are good recruiters of workers, that they have good record of meeting immigration laws and labor laws of the country. And if they've had good record of recruitment, we can pre-certify them for periods of time so that we don't go to the laborious individual labor certification process. And this person under this worker under this scheme will come for three years. At the end of three years, they could apply for three more years of extension of, of, their, of, their, of their bridge visa, or they could choose to go back to their countries of origin. So look, I, I just wanted to work for three years. I want to, I'm returning back to Mexico. I want to come three years later for another job. That's your choice. But they could stay for three more years. At the end of the six years, people had to make up their choice. They either uh, gra graduate to permanent residence or they return back to their home for another stint as a bridge worker visa on a bridge worker a few years later. We think this concept actually increased the circularity of migration. That the world is today full of workers who may really not want to come to the US to live here forever. They may just want to come here for a few years. They may not even want to bring their families. They may just want to educate them back in their countries and better schooling but they want to work legally and be able to save money. And this, our present system doesn't allow that. This new flexible circular system of migration would allow that. And we believe that in addition to the circularity, which will be the new concept in the bridge visa, we should also have the flexibility. We, as I said earlier, since 1990, we haven't changed the, the number of people we can admit even once. How many times have we changed interest rates since then? Why would, it, why would we not do similar, similarly in action for immigration numbers? So we believe there should be an independent body of experts, mostly people like Harry and his, and his peers, who will determine every two years, what is the number that we need for our country? Not lawmakers. And that should be, become the basis for the new number for the next two years. So we, on one hand, therefore, we'd accommodate what changes are taking place in our, in our country on the basis of both economic and fiscal policy issues and what the level of, of the occupational skills of immigrants that we have brought in on family that would accommodate all these to come up with a new number. We think this new dynamic approach, which, which establishes flexibility and, and circularity is the way to go. Last thing I want to say is because of the comment that Harry made about that we could face a recession. That given the, we could also have, on the other hand, we just passed a massive uh, uh, infrastructure bill. Who's going to do that work? 
given the, all the evidence about baby boomers and change and from, from manufacturing to service sector, if we need workers for, to make the uh, infrastructure bill, we would need a new infusion of foreign workers. So, but the, that could be taken into account by a flexible flexibility system that will determine the levels of immigration under our concept of the bridge view. So Jean, let me stop here and, and take questions. Thank you so much for the rest of you for participating today. Oh, thank you, thank you most. So just to recap, uh, Harry gave us an, an excellent uh, big picture um, and really the imperative to, uh, to, to think about uh, the strategies we should be using to, to harness uh, immigrant talent. And the three speakers talked about uh, attracting talent and the challenges that that strategy has, the recognition of talent, the, the talent and the development of talent. Um, and you know, to, to sum it up, is one strategy better than the other? Well, obviously not, no. Uh, all three have to be used simultaneously uh, using whatever opening uh, is there to, to employ that, that strategy. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna uh, quickly open uh, the floor for Q, Q's and A's. Uh, I see already we have a bunch of uh, questions in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Um, um, we'll start with um, uh, the one that addressed to, to Gina. Uh, Gina, you mentioned asylum seekers, and, and um, I'd like to hear more about matching people who have yet, uh, who have not yet achieved legal status with job opportunities what kind of strategies or issue, issues should be considered for this population? Yeah, the, the challenge is, is if they're not work authorized yet because they're in that, that six month or one year window, which really sucks. Um, the best, the, the only thing you can really do is help them gain uh, credentials, reskilling or upskilling at that time so that when they are eligible to apply for the jobs, they, they can do so quickly. Um, obviously, there is also an education that has to happen with employers around um, work authorization. It's one of the biggest questions we get um, from employers. And we also recommend all job seekers put on their CV that they are no work authorization required um, so that employers understand that quickly. So unfortunately, there's no there's no quicker or great answer for that one if they have don't have work authorization. Uh, in Virginia, and and just to, to, to say, some states um, um, do have a bit more flexibility. They perhaps allow they they allow um, uh, DACA or TPS hold, holders, uh, well, not TPS, but the DACA DACA holders to work uh, in certain occupations. So the, it depends a lot on the status that people have. Uh, the their employment opportunities. Uh, could, could be broader in some states and in some occupations than it is the case for others. Uh, also, oh, uh, Alex, you, you want to? Yeah, I was going to just say that that has been something that we've seen um, so, uh, several states in, in education doing more of is um, employing um, those that are on uh, on DACA in. It, as as teachers, um, but it is dependent on the state, and uh, I think you know to to uh, many times uh, what I have seen a couple of districts doing too is that if they have a high concentration of folks that are are highly skilled coming from other countries, they do kind of create kind of onboarding places to you know for spouses of of folks that might be on visas and are unable to work they can volunteer they can work in the schools in um in a, a volunteer capacity and then when they are able to change their status they're able to have a relationship already with the district and for to be hired um thank you alex uh, we have a question from uh Paul, um, although only a relatively small segment of the selection system is based on skills, isn't it the case that the very high percentage of uh, even family immigration stream have high, high levels of education and, and skills? Um, I will start just for the Q 
quick stat on, on, on this. Um, Harry mentioned earlier that there was a shift uh, in terms of uh, composition, in terms of countries of origin and, and ed education in re among recent immigrants. Uh, so just to keep in mind, folks, uh, almost half of recent immigrants uh, have a bachelor degree or higher, uh, which is uh, really incredible relative to uh, only a third of the current, uh, of, of all immigrants in the United States and of all native born in the United States. So uh, the, the recent, recently arrived immigrants across all streams um, and, 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 and across most countries are, are much higher educated than it used to be the case in the past. Uh, anyone else would like to say anything else on, on this? Uh, perhaps, Gina, if you see this among your um, uh, among the people you are working with, do you see that they're more highly educated than it used to be the case? Or not? Um, I would say that yes, we do have we do have more people coming into our program. Um, we also have more refugee flows uh, that are um, from middle income countries. So if you think of the Venezuelans, the Syrians, the Afghan evacuees, and now the Ukrainians. Um, so that's also a contributor. Um, so I would say, uh, yeah, there, there's definitely more demand. And there's more of a marketplace in other states. So you, you are seeing other um, places, other organizations starting to provide this service. We used to be the only one on, on the block, so to speak, and we're glad to see um, other partners starting to, to see this as a differentiated programming. And so to one of the comments, we think of it really as how do we help ensure that immigrants and refugees are getting jobs based on their skill level? Um, and that also includes, it's not exclusive of, but it is inclusive of those that are, are um, professionals. We call them professionals. We don't use the word high skilled. Um, so that we're ensuring that there's programming to help people get into professional jobs, which is not the way our workforce system is set up. Our workforce system is really set up, A, to help you learn English language, because they assume all immigrants don't speak it, or B, to help you get a, um, a rapid attachment job, a, a quick job that will help you uh, put food on the table. Um, there's now more of a movement towards like entry level tech jobs in terms of investing in skilling and reskilling. That's recent, but there's nothing really about if I'm a job, um, uh, a workforce coach, how am I supposed to help somebody that comes from China and they happen to have been a financial analyst? Um, they're not equipped for that. Um, thank you. We have a question for Harry. Um, Harry, you mentioned during the presentation um, that, uh, um, Uh, prioritizing highly skilled immigrants in place of low skilled workers. Um, is it, if that's the case, wouldn't, wouldn't that advance nativist and xenophobic, xenophobic bias uh, of deserving versus undeserving immigrants? And how would you address that? Well, um, that's a, a legitimate concern. Um, but I think what all of us are arguing on this panel uh, is that immigrants can play an important and a greater economic role to address the economic needs of the country. And the more we can base our immigrant system on, on that basis, especially with some of the, some of the policy changes that, that Muzaffar mentioned and, and uh, some of the other things that Alex and Gina said, uh, then, then, you, then I think you, you combat xenophobia because you indicate this is this is really good for the American economy. The, uh, the, these folks are contributing in sectors where we have this unmet need, uh, addressing shortages, addressing inflation, creating taxpayers uh, to pay for retirees. So all of that is good. And, and I think emphasizing that uh, would tend to, to uh, uh, confront and reduce that, that xenophobia. Um, and, and I'll say one other thing. Uh, you know, we, we all know that there is strong sentiment uh, in, in the country against uh, immigrants who, 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 who rely heavily on, on public benefit programs for the poor. You know, the, the public charge regulation, which like, I oppose, most of us opposed on this panel, I believe. But that indicates there's a strong sentiment uh, against immigrants who, who will be viewed as low wage, low income. 
So having people with very clear skills who clearly contribute uh, wh where the economy needs them uh, also will mean people with higher incomes and less dependence on the benefits. And I think, I think that would, would contribute to reducing that kind of xenophobia uh, and resentment as well. Can I just add, um, so, under public charge, one of the things that we really messaged, which is because some of our, our people are on public, we're on public benefits. Being on public benefits today doesn't say anything about your potential tomorrow, right? And so for us, it's also articulating that sometimes there are reasons people are on public benefits and that's okay, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what their potential is for is contributing to, to our communities and our economy. Um, so that's that's one thing I'd also say. The other thing is, is I do think we want to be a little careful about uh, couching immigrants in terms of this extractive nature of they have labor that they can give and we that, and meet needs, but also couple that with the conversation around how they really revive communities in rural areas, how they really contribute to um, sort of the things that Alex was talking about, health equity, education equity, right? Um, under the vaccine for vaccination, you know, people are more likely to get vaccinated if they see people like themselves um, providing the vaccines. Um, so I think, you know, coupling it with that messaging really then helps people understand that they're good for that immigrants are are contribute a lot and they're part of our shared prosperity. Um, thank you. I'd like to um, ask a uh, question that Lin Linda raised, and that's about recertification of immigrant and refugee professionals. And we all know that uh, the, uh, the Biden administration expanded uh, the refugee resettlement program. They expected you know, up to 125,000 um, uh, with the arrival of 75,000 of Afghan evacuees. There is a promise from bringing up to 100,000 Ukrainians. Uh, so the issues of recertification of humanitarian migrants is, is, is real and we'll, we'll face it very urgently very soon. So the question um, Linda asked um, is that if there has been any progress uh, recently uh, in addressing the recertification difficulties that this population faces through federally funded programs. Um, uh, there were such programs uh, for Vietnamese uh, doctors after the Vietnam War. Uh, can we do this again? What are the prospects for uh, doing this again this time around? Donna, do you want me to take that one? Okay. <laughs> um, so I would say um, there hasn't been a lot of progress. Um, the best solution that uh, we have right now is matching grant, um, which is to help people get access to certifications um, by contributing some, some, and then you know the community contributing some for them to be able to do that. Um, I will say there. Uh, I would say what the innovations we see is not on the federal side, but more on the private side, whether it's through social finance, um, so investors really contributing in. Um, something that we're looking at is, is really um, customizing uh, an app to help people navigate the credentialing and licensing process and the labor market process. Um, we think of it as like a GPS for your career, right? So how do you understand, uh, how do my skills translate into the US labor market? And uh, am I competitive and am I eligible to apply for work? And if I'm not, what is the process I have to go through? Um, and what are the alternatives? So for example, a lot of our doctors, um, including this wonderful Haitian uh, uh, asylee with his wife and three-year-old daughter who are living a homeless shelter in Queens, who are one of the beneficiaries of the New York Presbyterian um, program. Um, they, they, they are doing alternative career pathways, which is he's gotten a job now in the pediatric department of NYP as a researcher, right? Um, and so some of it is, is helping people navigate. Um, Upwardly Global is one of the biggest names that actually just helps people navigate those things. Wes also issues out a lot of sort of career pathway research. Um, so I would say, I think the field is developing. Um, Imprint Coalition, some, some of the members are here, have been working very hard, whether in community college system or whether in healthcare through Jose Ramon's um, work um, to really build out the field. And I think there's an opportunity to continue to build out the field. I will say, um, 
because of, you know, the, the, Jana said it, because of all these people coming in, I think there's a realization. And I think what the government now is pushing towards is um, career pathways. So how do we ensure that people can be on a career trajectory um, so that they're not languishing in uh, low income work? Because I think we had recent data that research that came out that said that actually five years after a refugee is here, they're actually economically worse off than they were when they first arrived. Um, so I think there's a push towards that career pathway work, but it's small compared to the, the bigger picture. Thank you, Gina. And uh, we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna ask uh, one last question to Moose, and that is um, switching a bit gears to uh, a different type of um, worker. So there are several bills um, in Congress to devise guest worker visa programs. Do you think that the reforms to H uh, H2B and H2A guest, guest worker visa programs could be helpful in addressing current labor shortages? And if, if, if so, what kind of um, reforms would you like to see? Sorry, if not. Uh, well, as, John, as you know better than anyone else, to speculate what Congress is going to do on immigration is oh, a- If you can read the-, the TV. Treacher Is a treacherous business. Uh, I mean, people had hoped that there would be a big uh, sort of advance on immigration legislation with reconciliation is unlikely to happen. If I had to make any guess, if the if the bill if the bill back better gets cut and diced in various portions, I think there's a possibility of various pieces of immigration getting attached to some pieces in that diced phenomenon. And the candidates for that are obvious. Uh, the highest I think priority is probably for Dreamers and TPS holders. There's a lot of support for them. And next, probably the farm workers. So there'll be uh, some possibility for improving, expanding farm worker programs and letting more people in. Uh, and, you know, I think after that, the, you know, I think the, the others are, I think, more difficult candidates. I think any bill on essential workers probably is unlikely to, uh, to move. But I think the, the, what the timing on this is going to be really hard. I think there are some people who speculate that some members of Congress want something to be done just before this session ends because they're expecting more restrictionist forces to take uh, leadership in Congress next year. So you may see a minor possibility of something happening towards the end of this legislative session or in the uh, or in the uh, or in the session, you know, after the uh, after after the election, uh, but I think again, uh, uh, presidential politics is going to cloud everything. There's always people like us speculate that the best year for any congressional election is the year between the midterm and the general election. So that's 2023. So that's our best sort of uh, timeline or any progress on any immigration reform, but it's likely to be marginal and not a major overhaul. Thank you very, very much, everyone, um, for, for this insightful uh, conversation. Um, I would like to thank uh, the audience for joining us. Um, um, I apologize for any questions that uh, we didn't answer. There were some really great questions. I didn't even have to use my own because you guys were amazing and you, you gave so many questions. Um, so uh, the audio and video recording of this webinar will be available on the events website uh, of NBI tomorrow. Uh, uh, if there, there were any reporters on the call, uh, please contact uh, Michelle Mittelstadt at and Mittelstadt at migrationpolicy.org with any questions. Uh, just one more time, our new report, uh, Leveraging the Skills of Immigrant Healthcare Professionals in Illinois and Chicago, uh, is available online. Um, you can access on, on that uh, website, you could access also data for Illinois as well as uh, the United States and 24 other states. Uh, with sufficient data uh, that describe the demographic trends uh, and, um, and, and the underemployment uh, trends. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to us uh, um, with ideas and questions. Uh, we are delighted that you are part of the thinking, doing the thinking with us. 
uh, and have a wonderful day.